Let us pray. May this sacrifice, O oh God, remain active in its effects and work ever more strongly within us. Through Christ our Lord.
the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we praise you and we thank you for another beautiful night, for an opportunity to come before your Son, Jesus, and the Blessed Sacrament. Lord, just continue to restore our hearts, restore our minds, restore our souls during this Lenten season. Restore our understanding of the priesthood of your son, Jesus, how we live this beautiful priesthood. Just give us the grace that we need to be faithful priests, patterned after the priesthood of your son, Jesus Christ. Help us to proclaim the good news to every corner of creation. Give us strength to consecrate every corner of creation to your amazing glory. Open our minds and our ears and our hearts to an overflow of your charity, your love, and your mercy. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, it's St. Patrick's Day, and you're here. Praise be to Jesus Christ. The Irish pubs have nothing on us tonight. <laughs> Quick little story about St. Patrick's. It's not so much a story, it's so much of a, it's more of a fun fact. The modern day way that we do confessions uh, originated uh, with St. Patrick and his monks. The idea of like a box-like area where you can go and do it in private, one-on-one, -on -one kind of creating more of a, a secretive element that was developed by St. Patrick and the Irish monks. Uh, and then other, um, other communities saw how they did it and said, that's awesome, let's do it that way. And so it exists today. So if uh, those of you who went to confession today, you were following after the heart of St. Patrick, okay? Uh, which is not so much green beer, but God's mercy and God's love. Uh, just a quick recap of where we've been and where we're going tonight. So uh, the first evening of restoration, I, I talked about how God had this plan for creation where it was ordered towards worship, that um, the tree and the garden was the original holy of holies, that the sanctuary, the original sanctuary was Eden, and then the outer areas of creation was the rest of God's temple, kind of the outer courtyard. And that Adam and Eve were the first priests, so to speak, of this original temple, this original creation. Uh, and that uh, they had these specific duties to, of course, guard the sanctuary, guard Eden. But they had this duty to, to work creation. And the, wor the word there is abad. Uh, and that is the Hebrew word for the work of priests to go out and work creation and to order creation so that it can be brought into the sanctuary. In, an, in another way, you could say expanding the boundaries of Eden to eventually incorporate all of creation. So all of creation would be ordered towards the worship and the glory of the Lord. Okay? And we saw how that work was to subdue the earth, to have dominion over the earth, which is not to be a tyrant over it, but to rightly order it, right, to, to work it. It was going to take something from Adam and Eve, right? It was going to, God wanted them to participate in his liturgical act, not just to be a spectator. Uh, and that's why Adam, in a sense, was to go out and to work the beast of the field, right? The beast of the field, to tame them, to order them so they could be brought into, brought into the sanctuary, to be brought into Eden, and we saw in the second talk how that, that was just a crash and burn assignment, that Adam and Eve failed miserably, that instead of going out and working this beast of the field, this serpent, uh, they failed to guard the sanctuary. They allowed this serpent to come in. Adam uh, refused to lay down his life for this nahash, which is another word for dragon, right? He failed to offer his life as a sacrifice 
um, and allowed the sanctuary to be corrupted. He allowed his own heart, the heart of his wife, to be corrupted. Uh, and that as a consequence, they kind of lost that priesthood. We also saw how the Israelites in the desert and their struggle with the golden calf also resulted in a loss of their priesthood. So this is like a theme that keeps running through. God wants to restore his priesthood to his people and they keep losing it, right? Until today. And that's where we are today. How does Jesus Christ restore our priesthood? How does Jesus do what Adam, how do Jesus and Mary, in a sense, together do what Adam and Eve failed to do? And how does that bring about a restoration of our priesthood? And then from there, we're going to look at how we're incorporated into that priesthood. And then on the last talk, we're going to look at how we live that priesthood day in and day out in our life. So I want to begin tonight's reflection uh, looking a little more concretely at Jesus' contest with Satan in the wilderness, okay, which we hear every year on the first Sunday of Lent. So we heard it just two weekends ago. This year we're in year C, so we're walking through Luke's gospel. So I'll actually reread that gospel a little bit and we'll, we'll unpack uh, the connections between uh, Adam and Eve and their temptation and, of course, how Jesus overcomes those temptations. But before we dive into that, I want to make reference to Mark's version of this event. Um, Mark's is really short. He leaves out all of the temptations. Each gospel has its own kind of charism, its own focus, its own energy to it. And Mark's is like, let's just keep this thing moving, you know. Mark is the gospel for the working man. He, uh, he's, he leaves out a lot of details. He keeps the action moving. You know, think of it as like one of those 80-minute action movies. Okay, that's Mark, all right? So Mark leaves out a lot of details. However, when Mark does give a detail, it's really significant. Because if he could leave it out, he would leave it out, right? Let's keep this action moving. And there's a detail in Mark's gospel that's so key um, to our understanding of what's going on. Mark refers to Jesus when he goes out into the wilderness as going out amongst wild beasts. Wild beasts. Now that is a clear connection to Genesis, right? Because the most cunning beast of the field was the Nahash, was the serpent, was the dragon, okay? So Jesus is going out to meet the beast, right? Instead of allowing the beast to sneak into the sanctuary, Jesus is going out into the wilderness to confront the beast, to abad the serpent, to work it, to master it, and to order it towards uh, the worship of the Lord, okay? So Jesus is outside of the garden. That's the wilderness. It's that outer area. That's where this takes place. And if you ever go to the Mount of Temptations, it really is like out into the desert, you know. Uh, there's not much around it, and it's pretty dry. It's kind of like Phoenix, okay, without like an entire group of people uh, living there and playing golf there. Anyways. So in Matthew and Luke's version, we hear more of the story. This is where we get the detailed, um, the detailed uh, temptations, okay? And where we start to see that uh, analogous relationship between Adam's responsibility to subdue the earth and Jesus, how he succeeds where Adam fails. And in part, we also see where Jesus remembers where the Israelites, remember when they were in the desert, they forgot, okay? Um, one of the things that we'll see, I, I won't make specific reference to each one. If you, if you look in the Bible, if you have any kind of Bible with notations, it'll probably tell you. But for every response that Jesus gives to Satan, uh, it's from the book of Deuteronomy. So Jesus remembers something from Deuteronomy and he uses that to combat Satan. Now, real briefly, why Deuteronomy? Well, if, if you heard my homily, I think it was this past weekend, I talked about how Deuteronomy was the second law. 
It was given after the Israelites fell um, with the golden calf. God basically realized, okay, this, my firstborn Israel is a rascally child, and he needs more than your standard run-of-the-mill like rules. He needs a second set of laws to keep him on track, to keep him focused, right? Sometimes we have kids like that, right? Okay. Hopefully we don't, but sometimes we do. God bless them. God love them. We give them a Deuteronomic law, okay? So that's kind of what happens here, okay? And Jesus remembers Deuteronomy. He remembers what God had said. It's just so beautiful. Where the Israelites forgot, where Adam and Eve forgot, Jesus remembers. Anyways, let's read this really briefly, uh, and then we'll start to unpack it. So this is the one from Luke. Filled with the Holy Spirit, Jesus returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the desert for 40 days to be tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and when they were over, he was hungry. The devil said to him, if you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. Jesus answered him, it is written, one does not live on bread alone. Then he took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a single instant. The devil said to him, I shall give to you all this power and glory, for it has been handed over to me, and I may give it to whomever I wish. All this will be yours if you worship me. Jesus said to him in reply, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him alone shall you serve. Then he led him to Jerusalem, made him stand on the parapet of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you, and with their hands they will support you, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him in reply, It also says, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every temptation, he departed from him for a time. So let's unpack these uh, temptations just a little bit. So the first temptation is Satan tempts Jesus to turn stones into bread. In other words, the temptation is to force creation to serve his own hunger. Okay. Now, that's not exactly proper dominion, right? Stones are meant to be stones, not bread. Stones are not, they don't glorify God by being forced or manipulated into becoming bread, right? Stones can glorify God in the building of a temple, uh, in the construction of things, in the offerings of things, right? But to manipulate, to force the stones, to force creation to make it into what I want in the moment. That's the temptation, right? And Jesus remembers in Deuteronomy that man does not live on bread alone. That ultimately his life force isn't about just merely satisfying his hunger. He knows that if, if he needs to be fed, the Father will give him the food. Remember, that's what the Father did for the Israelites. When they were hungry and without food, God fed them with manna that came from heaven. Part of that manna was, was kept uh, in the tabernacle of Moses, right, as a way of remembering that God feeds us when we need him to, right? And so Jesus understands that that's not his role um, as the new priest, the new high priest. He is to order creation towards the worship of God, not towards his own hunger, not to manipulate it, not to force it, but to properly order it. Jesus also knows that his mission as a priest is not just to feed himself, it's not to be fed, but to feed others. Jesus provides us with the new bread from heaven which we hear about in John chapter 6. He keeps repeating it. I am the bread from heaven. Right? Whoever feeds on me will never die. He will have life everlasting. Jesus' mission isn't to force creation to become food, 
but to offer himself on the cross as a sacrifice so that man can have true food. The food that he really needs to live in eternity. Adam and Eve, in disobedience, took the fruit from the tree. Jesus and Mary offer their bodies as sacrifice so that true food can come forth. Jesus offers his body as the sacrificial lamb on the cross so that we can have the, the, the bread from life in the Eucharist. Mary offers her virginal womb so that this new tree of life that will provide this fruit for, can grow from within her. So in, in these cases of Adam and Eve, we see, or not in Adam and Eve, in the new Adam and the new Eve, and Jesus and Mary, we see a sacrifice of their body so that new life and new food can come forth. Right? Remember what Adam failed to do in the face of the serpent. He failed to offer his life as a sacrifice. Sacrifice, when we look at worship throughout the ages, is probably the most intimate term to describe worship. It's the offering of something. Adam failed to offer himself to work the beast. And in doing so, the beast was able to subdue him. Jesus uh, recognizes that. And eventually from the desert to the cross, he will offer his body as a sacrifice. Mary offered her body as a sacrifice so this new tree of life can grow within her so this new fruit can come forth. Second temptation. Satan attempts to convince Jesus that all of the created world could be his if he were just to bow down and worship the serpent. What's interesting about this is Jesus first remembers, he doesn't say it, but he remembers that the created world is already his for governance. <laughs> uh, I don't need you to give me the world because guess what, dude, it's already mine right? It was through Jesus that the world was created, right? We have this belief in our Catholic theology that when one member of the Trinity acts, all three are present acting. So when the Spirit hovered over the waters to create the world, where does the Spirit come from? It's sent from the Father through the Son, right? So Jesus was already there at creation. He knows it's already under his governance, okay? He knows the law better than Satan knows it himself, okay? He knows creation better than Satan knows it himself. And he knows that he's not created to worship creation, right? Man is not meant to worship something else within the created world, that makes no sense. He's called to worship God alone. To worship something created is to invert the relationship that the new Adam is called to have with the created world. Rather, the mission of, the, the mission of Christ the high priest is to take all of creation, all of the cosmos, and rework it back into the worship of the Godhead, including the serpent. Right Now, this kind of brings up some cool points. I won't dabble too much on this, but it's good to think about. This is why we have a liturgical cycle. See, one of the most frustrating things to Catholics is that Easter moves throughout the year, right? How many times have we said, oh man, if only, just pick a date, you know? Could we just pick a date and make that Easter, you know? like we do with Christmas. But the reason why Easter is celebrated and moves is because it's based off the lunar cycle. The moon is an image of the church. Why? Because its light is not its own. When you look up at the bright shining moon in the sky, that's not the moon's light. That's the reflected light of the sun. The moon is what it is, not because the moon is this bright, shining, beautiful object in the sky. It is what it is because it belongs to the sun. 
It's the reflected light of the sun. That's what the moon is. In a way, it's an oxymoron. It's because it is what it is not. <laughs> it's kind of funny. The moon is what it is not, right? Because it reflects the light of the sun, right? So, so much of our liturgy is based on cosmic movement and flow. And we've already lost that to a degree. We don't want to put a nail in that coffin, okay? Like, we need to hang on to this rhythmic, cosmic movement, you know, where there's elements of nature being brought into um, our worship because Jesus Christ didn't just come to save human beings. He came to save the entire created world. He came to redeem the world and bring it all back into it. So anyways, I, I could go off on that, right? If you want to read more on this cosmic dimension, um, I highly recommend Cardinal Ratzinger, or Pope Benedict XVI, Spirit of the Liturgy. He's got a whole section where he deals with the cosmic elements of the liturgy and why that's so important. Anyways, Jesus' mission is to redirect the entire cosmos back to the worship of the Father. Okay? But in a sense, if we go a little bit deeper into this temptation, and all three of them to some degree, there's a temptation here, uh, especially for Adam and Eve, to worship themselves. Right? When Adam and Eve, when they obeyed their own desires and their own wishes, what they did is they made themselves the Lord of their own lives. And in taking the fruit, they used creation for their own wishes as if they were God. Right? So, and they did it in a liturgical way, you know, because everything at this point in creation is liturgy. And that's the same thing that happens with the Israelites in the desert, right? Remember when they're, Moses goes up the mountain and they're waiting for him. They become impatient and they want to worship God. They're ready to worship God, but they don't want to wait for God to lead them, for God to direct them, for God to show them how he desires to be worshipped. They took it in their own hands, right? They made themselves gods. They ended up worshipping God themselves, worshiping how they wanted to worship, right? That's a part of this sinfulness. I mean, we do this all the time, all the time, right? We assert our own preferences, our own ideas. Well, I like this, so therefore God wants me to do this, right? Rather than seeing liturgy as a gift that's passed on, we kind of take creative liberties with it and do kind of what we want with it. And we say, well, God doesn't care. Well, actually, when you look at the history of liturgy, God cares very much. God gives very detailed prescriptions about what to do, how to do it, when to do it, what needs to be on your heart when you do it, you know? I mean, he's very detailed in that. So we have to be really careful, you know? And it's one of those things that, that the Adam and Eve and the Israelites and, and, and all of those who have followed really struggled with it. Well, I want to do this, but I don't want to do that. And it's, we got to be careful because sometimes what we do without even realizing is we turn ourselves into the Lord of all life, the Lord of all worship, uh, and make ourselves God. And I think there are a lot of people out there who don't realize they're worshiping themselves, their own desires, their own wants, their own preferences. Okay? So we've got to be really careful with that. It's kind of hidden in the weeds of all of this, right? Third temptation, Satan tries to convince Jesus to throw himself off of the temple to prove that God will send angels to catch him. Okay? Now the father did not initiate the son to test the father's love. And Jesus knows that that's not the father's initiating love. Testing God with his own creation is not a part of subduing it. Okay? Adam and Eve kind of forgot this. They were duped a little bit by Satan here. Remember what Remember what Satan says to Eve? It's, it, it's a form of a testing. He says, did God really say dot, dot, dot? Did God really say this? Maybe we should test to see if God really said this. You know? It was a trick. It was a test. But Jesus remembers. No, 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 no. I don't need to test the Father. 
The father is not in need of testing. Right? Where the original Adam failed to subdue the cunning beast, the new Adam succeeds. He conquers Satan's domain and he offers his life as the ultimate sacrifice to defend the created world and his bride, the church, so that all might be reoriented back towards the glory and worship of the Father. That's how Jesus restores our priesthood. But it's more than just his temptation in the desert. Let's, there's a few other really cool points that are worth thinking about. So working and guarding, gar, working and guarding, right? The, the horticultural words of working and, or tilling and keeping. So God leading the Israelites into the desert for 40 years to help them rediscover what it means to worship him is one of these beautiful themes. So much happens in the desert in scripture. Uh, it's in the wilderness, the place of danger, the place that seems far away from God's presence is the place where Israel receives its new covenant and learns how to live completely for God again. In a sense, that's what we're doing every Lent. We're going out into the wilderness, so to speak, to rediscover what it means to live for God again, to live completely for the Lord. Right? And the Lord can be worshipped even in the wilderness. Right? The Lord can be worshipped even in the wilderness. That's so important to remember because sometimes when we feel like we're in the wilderness, it feels really hard to worship God. But it's in those moments where that can actually be our greatest act of worship. Right? When it's hard, when it really hurts, when it's dry and we're not receiving a lot, when we're struggling with temptation. Those are the moments that, that only, in a sense, like shape and form our worship in ways we can't even imagine. The practice of the scapegoat on the Day of Atonement. There's another beautiful connection to how Christ restores our priesthood. So um, on the Day of Atonement, what they would do is they'd take a goat, and the high priest would lay his hands on the goat, and in a sense he was passing on the sins of the people onto the goat. Okay, And then he would send that goat out into the wilderness to die. And the image was all of Israel's sins go out with this goat and they die in the wilderness. It was a very priestly act on the Day of Atonement. Okay? This was an act of guarding the purity of the tabernacle and the people who are called to worship the presence of God within the tabernacle. What's amazing about this is if you ever get a chance to the Holy Land and you go and you visit the Garden of Gethsemane, which is just across a little valley from the temple. And when you go, there's a church there. It's really beautiful in the Garden of Gethsemane. So this is where our Lord wept uh, and sweat blood over the fact that he was going to die for the sins of Israel. There's one view that you get of the temple from the Garden of Gethsemane. It's the scapegoat gate. That's literally when Jesus was Weeping, sweating blood, his view of the temple was the gate where the high priest on the day of atonement would lead out the goat who had been laid on its back the sins of Israel, right? So beautiful. Um, really powerful to pray there, to know that that's what Jesus, Jesus was thinking about, the sins of the people being placed on his shoulders as he is sent out uh, to die. Um, Coincidentally, not coincidentally, providentially, where does Jesus die? Outside of the walls of Jerusalem. Jesus dies outside of the walls of the temple, outside of the temple, outside of the primary walls on Mount Calvary. Okay? Now, why is that significant? Well, where should Adam have been when he confronted the serpent? Outside of the sanctuary. Where was, what was Adam called to do but to work that beast, willing to offer his life to overcome and conquer that beast? That's what Jesus does. Jesus goes outside of the sanctuary and he confronts suffering and death, the two enemies that Satan is an agent of, and he fights them, he overcomes them, 
and he offers his life and dies as a sacrifice uh, to overcome the evil one, to subdue death and suffering. So now, death and suffering can be ordered towards worship because Christ has redeemed them, right? Christ has not destroyed death and suffering in the sense that he's eliminated them from the picture. What he has done is he has conquered them through his sacrificial, liturgical love so that as we face death and suffering, we don't have to fear them. We know that we can worship God in them, that they can become, in a sense, our greatest acts of worship by how we love the Lord and offer ourselves to the Lord as we face our mortality, as we suffer. Right? This is why it's, it's really strange for Christians to fear suffering, to whine about suffering, to fight with suffering. Our entire faith is built on a God who conquered it. Why are you afraid of it? Why are you angry at it? It's your means to salvation, right? Those who die with Christ rise with Christ. Like, our suffering is a gift. I know it doesn't feel that way <laughs> in the moment, right? But we have to approach our suffering knowing that Christ has subdued it. He has shown dominion over it, right? Suffering is a gift, and we squander that gift all the time by trying to get out of it, by trying to squirm out of it. Like Adam and Eve, we are priests. Priests are made to suffer. Priests are made to enter into the suffering of Christ. Not to remain in that. We're not sadistic. It's not like, yay, suffering, woohoo, you know. And that was me like beating my back here, okay. It's not sadistic, but it's because it's we know that it's the path that leads to new life in Jesus, right? Ezekiel's vision of the new temple. Here's another really beautiful one. In, um, Ezekiel has this vision of the new temple that is to come. And uh, he sees a river flowing from that new temple that extends all the way to the Dead Sea. Like the Dead Sea is the peak of the worst spot of the wilderness because it's where there's no fresh water for life to come. It's, it's literally salt water. Like if you go to Israel, you can go and swim in the Dead Sea and you don't really swim in the Dead Sea. You float without a raft. Like it's really muddy and nasty and, but you, it's kind of cool to like walk out on that water and to feel like you're, you're, you're bobbing in it without a raft, you know? It's, it's very bizarre. But it's, it's the place where things go to die. And in Ezekiel's temple, this new temple, the water even goes out to where there's death, where no life can be, you know? That's Christ conquering suffering and death is to show that his life, there are no places where Christ's life can't go, where Christ's blood can't flow and touch and revive and restore, right? And it communicates this like future work that God wants. God wants his life to go to places where there, where there seems like there's no life. We shouldn't be afraid to carry the gospel to places where there seemingly is no life because the power of Christ's life can conquer and overcome and rework and reorder even things that seem seemingly have no life. That's the beauty of the gospel the power of the gospel. Another connection, and, and this is kind of the, the final one to bring about, is um, the connection of Adam um, as we approach Easter. So let's think about Easter for a moment. I don't want to talk too much about this because, again, I have to think about what Dr. Bergsma is going to talk about, and I don't want to spoil it because he's going to do it better than I can anyways. But So it's noted... In John's Gospel, that the tomb of our Lord, where Jesus is buried, is where? In a garden. <laughs> Jesus, after he offers his life, is buried in a garden. Okay? Jesus' sacrificed body, offered as an act of guarding the temple and all who dwell in it, and as a sacrifice to conquer and subdue the great enemy of death is laid into the earth, into a garden. 
In his death and resurrection, Jesus has become exactly what he predicted. The grain of wheat, again, all this, all this gardening imagery, right? He's the grain of wheat that has died and fallen into the earth to bring forth new life. His death on the cross is what cultivates new life in us. Now, there's a beautiful word right there. Cultivate. It has at its, at its root the word cult. Now, when we think of cult today, we think of really weird religions that are bad, okay? But cult, in the traditional sense, means religious worship. What is your cult? When they would ask you that, they mean, how do you worship? It's only in modern day kind of terminology that we've distorted that word into a negative meaning, it shares the same root word of the garden activity of cultivating, right? In other words, our Paschal mystery worship is the work, and this is what we're going to get to, I promise. Our Paschal mystery worship is the work that cultivates new life in us and has the power to cultivate new life in the world, okay? And of course, one last cool little connection here. When Jesus rose from the dead, who did Mary Magdalene mistake him to be? A gardener, the gardener. In a sense, she wasn't wrong. <laughs> he really is the gardener, the one who cultivates the world, who cultivates creation so that all can be brought back into the glory of the guard in the sanctuary uh, for the glory and honor of the Father on high. Right? And what we're going to see is that the sacramental life of the church through the ministerial priesthood cultivates that passion, death, and resurrection of Christ in those who enter into that worship, those who offer themselves in that worship. And then that new life sends those uh, priests, the common priesthood of believers, out to the wilderness of the world to cultivate and rework and reorder all of creation so that it is brought then back into the sanctuary, into that new life, that passion, death, and resurrection of Christ that's given to us in the Eucharist. That's where we're going, ladies and gentlemen. That's the beauty of our faith. But we have one little step before we get to that, and this is where we're going to go next week. How are we initiated into the priesthood of Jesus Christ so that we can offer ourselves as a sacrifice in the making present of the Paschal mystery, and then have the power of the Paschal mystery within us to go out into the world to cultivate. There's one step of how do we get to that? How are we initiated into that? And I will save that for next week, keep, keep you coming back, um, hopefully. <laughs>